Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no hollow, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps and Papers. Well, that was fucking creepy, Dan. (laughs) My God, you could have warned warned me you were going to do that. I'm Dan. Um, I'm Lindsay and totally terrified. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, welcome to the show. And what if I just talk like that uh, every episode the whole time? Two weeks away from our big one year anniversary episode. Well, if you're going to do it, you're going to have to do it a little bit louder. I know, I'll do it louder. Uh, we are two weeks away from our uh, one-year anniversary of September 17th, so very excited. We're going to have a little party in here. I'm so excited about the cake <laughs> I ordered for us. Uh, I'm excited, too. And, and, the, and the celebratory episode is going to come out on the 15th. So that week, it's going to be a bigger episode full of more stories, a little more, little more meat than normal. Uh, as a thank you to uh, all of you creeps and peepers just for listening and supporting the show and spreading the word. Yeah. Exactly. It's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun. So much fun, actually. Mm -hmm. And I'm not in an insane asylum like I thought I would be. Right. You've adjusted. You still get creeped out, you know, a few times each week. But then you're, I feel like it's the new normal. You're used to just being creeped out. Yeah. I'm used to constantly being like, what was that? (laughs) Right. right. Every day of my life, (laughs) middle of the day, nighttime, all the time. Uh, we have a new Dybbuk Box crew sweatshirt in the store at badmagicmerch.com, so that's very cool. Remember when we got that Dybbuk Box from mm-hmm. someone? Yeah. Yeek. We, we had somebody stop by uh, a week or two ago in the studio, and they were like, is that the cursed stuff? You know, they know that we've gotten stuff. And I was like, yep. And they immediately walked back out of the room. They're like, nope. Funny. Like, it, it genuinely weirded him out. He we- was like, he was a time suck and scared to death fan. And on the scared to death stuff, he was like, cool, but nope. Funny. Didn't want to be near it. Didn't want to touch it. We yeah. had a few people early on offer to take it, but then they wanted us to ship it. And I was like, nope, I'm, I don't even want to touch it to send it somewhere. <laughs> uh, thank you to the Keith, Logan, and Kate for the uh, awesome merch design, by the way. I always try and thank them. Good job. Mm-hmm. Did you just call them the Keiths? Yeah. Oh, well, it just sounded like you said, thank you to the Keith. Oh, to the Keith? Like they're one entity? <laughs> Thank you to the Keith. <laughs> I hear laughing out in the uh, studio. I'm picturing both their heads on one body now, and it's an awesome image in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you guys just this weird merch mutant just in the in the corner. Thank you to the Keith. <laughs> Hello, Keith. And then they're just ah working away on ah. <laughs> designing. Well, that's it from now on. <laughs> uh, I have two stories today. Uh, how about you, Lulu? Oh, using my nickname. Mm-hmm. That's so sweet. Uh, I have one story, and it is quite lengthy okay and it's um i would say not our usual vein of things a okay bit, it's a little bit different for me and i'm I like different yeah i'm stoked about it yep you've been uh yeah you've told me about it a few times i know uh my first story is a short short one and a horrible one uh the ritualistic 1981 murder of leroy carter jr uh what dark god was he sacrificed to huh never heard of it and then a big tale after that the 2011 and 2012 gary indiana supposed demonic infestation that surrounded latoya ammons and her family commonly known as the ammons haunting or as the house of 200 demons the i think the, really notorious haunting oh yeah i don't know it uh you say gary indiana mm-hmm. and um by it's my, outside chicago no i know where it is yeah just for fans oh i uh my brain immediately went to this George Strait song. Yeah. And it's like, he calls out all these like cities and states. Uh, Gary, Indiana, Bismarck, North Dakota, New York, LA. Sorry, it's just, that's all that's in my head right now. <laughs> all right. <laughs> You're welcome. And now Amarillo by Morning is in my head because every time I hear George Strait, that song <gasps> immediately starts playing. Kyler loves that song. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you have some time to get cozy as I set up the first tale. Okay, can I show off my new socks? You can. Okay. They're new unicorns, you guys. Look at oh, that. Oh, fresh, at- fresh yuns. Thank you. Leroy Leroy Carter needed a place to sleep. It was February 7th, 1981, and Leroy was walking through Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, looking for a spot to curl up in his sleeping bag for the night. Almost a decade earlier, the homeless, now 29-year-old, had survived the jungles of Vietnam, only to make it back to a city that seemingly wanted nothing to do with veterans. And he'd soon fallen into a world of petty crimes and hard drugs. And on the night of February 7th, he was cold and bone tired, and he just wanted to catch as many hours of undisturbed sleep as he could before returning to his life of confusion and hopelessness. 
Leroy was just one of many San Francisco residents living in similar circumstances at the time, one of many seeking shelter in Golden Gate Park at night. In the 60s, the area around the park had become ground zero for the hippie counterculture movement, with more and more disillusioned young people pouring into the area from around the nation every day. Teens and 20-somethings trying to find their purpose, looking for free love, good music, and a variety of ways to turn on, tune in, and drop out. And then when the 60s rolled into the 70s, many of the area hippies started turning to harder drugs, particularly heroin, to ease the burden of living on the streets once the romanticism of being part of a new cultural movement had worn off. By the 80s, free love had been replaced by yuppies and high-priced condos in a growing epidemic of opioid-related overdoses and crime, and the gorgeous parks that made San Francisco one of the most beautiful cities in the world were now overrun with troubled people who didn't have anywhere else to go. And Leroy Carter was one of these people. And while many of these people were sadly destined to suffer some sad and tragic final hours, very few of their lives would end as sadly and tragically as Leroy's. Time now for the tale of the ritualistic sacrifice of Leroy Carter Jr. Late in the night of February 7th, perhaps early on the morning of February 8th, Leroy curled up in his sleeping bag at the base of a tree near Alfred Lake, not far from the end of Haight Street, when he closed his eyes for the second to last time. He would soon reopen them to witness a type of terror not many of us will ever experience, a terror he wouldn't live long enough to share with anyone. Leroy wouldn't live to see the dawn. No one knows exactly what happened to him that night. No one knows what events led up to his final moments. But the following day, the police found Leroy's dead body still inside his sleeping bag. Most of it. Ugh. One important piece of Leroy was missing. His head. In its place, wedged inside the bloody stump of his neck, police discovered a chicken bone and two corn cobs. What? And then they found something even stranger nearby, about 50 feet from his body were the mutilated remains of several chickens. Investigating officers found the whole scene incredibly disturbing. Even in a big city like San Francisco, where finding the bodies of murder victims sadly wasn't that uncommon, this murder was highly unusual. There was no evidence of a fight, a scuffle, or an attempted robbery. The police speculated that the attacker had used an axe or a machete, something sharp enough to take off a head in one swing. Leroy may not have even been awake when the weapon cut through his neck. If he's lucky. Why him? Why the chickens and the corn cobs? It appeared that Leroy had been sacrificed in some kind of ritual. The San Francisco PD assigned the case to Officer Sandy Gallant, who was not a homicide detective. She worked in intelligence, and she just finished looking into the Jonestown massacre in Guyana and how Jim Jones connected to San Francisco. She'd become the San Francisco PD's resident cult and a cult expert, and Sandy thought the dead chickens pointed to Santeria. Santeria is 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 a syncretic African religion that developed in Cuba between the 16th and 19th centuries. It began with the Yoruba people, an African tribe living in what is now north-central Nigeria. Slaves captured and taken to the Caribbean had to hide their ancient traditions and worship of the old gods of their homeland within Catholicism the religion they'd been forced to become a part of and the only one they were allowed to openly participate in. And when these slaves and their descendants traveled to the southern United States, Santeria, their new religion, came with them. Sacrifice is an important element of Santeria because of its belief in deities known as Orisha, of which there are hundreds. And the Orisha often want blood. Each individual is believed to have a specific Orisha who has been connected to them since before their birth and who watches over them and can interact with them, a guardian angel of sorts. And the faithful believe that tributes must be paid to these guardian gods with tributes and sacrifices, often blood sacrifices. Santeria's followers usually meet in the homes of santeros or santeras, priests, shamans, etc., to venerate specific orisha at altars set up to worship them. A central ritual is the toque de santo, in which practitioners drum, sing, and dance to encourage an orisha to possess someone. They believe that through this possessed individual they can communicate directly with one of their gods. Where most religions fear spiritual possession and consider it demonic, Santeria's believers welcome it. And while most practitioners of Santeria are non-violent, there's another religion, often mistaken for Santeria, that shares many of the same rituals, but often with a dark twist. Palomayambe, another syncretic religion that formed in Cuba. If Santeria were akin to Christianity, Palomayambe would be akin, at least in the eyes of many, to devil worship. And some think Leroy's crime uh, pointed to, to Palomayambe. 
Many Palomayambe believers worship dark Orisha, gods in charge of death and mayhem, believing that if they can please these angry gods, they can harness their dark powers and bring death and despair to their enemies and keep the same from coming to them. Not knowing if the killer was practicing some form of Santeria or Palomayambe, or if they were just using elements of rituals as a cover-up to distract investigators, Sandy turned to a coroner from Dade County, Florida, Charles Wetley, who was also a leading expert on African uh, d dis diaspora religions such as Santeria and Palomayambe. After considering the crime scene, one thing stuck out to Wetley. If this really was the ritual he was familiar with, the one he thought the evidence pointed to, he was certain that Leroy's body and his missing head would soon be rejoined. Oh. The ritual would be incomplete until the corpse was made whole again. Gross. According to the traditional ritual, the head would be returned to the scene of the crime 42 days exactly after the murder. Six weeks after the murder, on March 22, 1981, Officer Gallant and her partner returned to the park, staking out the spot where Carter's headless body had been found. Sandy and her partner hid out and stayed as quiet as possible so they wouldn't alert anyone to their presence, either the killer or anyone who might reveal them. The longer they waited, the more their minds played tricks on them. Each shadow began to look like someone holding a head by its hair. An innocent group of park visitors suddenly seemed like they were a gathering, murderous cult slinking around in the distance. Quiet conversations sounded like chanting. Sandy felt colder than she thought she should have. The night air felt thicker and heavier than normal. She constantly got the chills, constantly felt on edge. Sandy and her partner waited and watched the entire night from dusk till dawn, and no one showed up to the murder site. At least not anyone they saw despite their continual vigilance. When day finally broke, they thought to themselves that the Florida coroner must have been wrong. He either didn't understand the ritual he told them about, or a ritual had never been performed in the first place. The two exhausted officers started walking down to Alfred Lake, just a very short distance away, when they spotted something laying on the shore. Uh-uh. Leroy Carter's head. It had been returned to the site of the murder that night, exactly as Charles Wetley had predicted. Yee. How had the killer gotten so close to them without attracting their attention? The killer had been there that night, very close nearby, in their direct line of sight, and they had both completely missed him. Two experienced police investigators had somehow not seen a killer approach the area of their stakeout, even though the sole purpose of their stakeout had been to spot that killer. Was the killer perhaps unable to be seen? If you believe in the power of Palomayambe, the ability to turn invisible, the ability to hide specifically from those who are seeking to do you harm, powers like this are believed to be very possible if the right sacrifice is made, if the right rituals are followed and the proper Orisha is pleased. Maybe another ritual has been performed to protect the killer. The strange return of Leroy's head unfortunately gave police no new leads into his murder and his case went cold. And to this day, Leroy Carter Jr.'s murder remains unsolved. Yeah. Isn't that a strange detail at the end? That's why I chose to put this story in. That is so uncomfortable. 42 days after the murder, his head is returned to the scene of the crime. And that guy knew that was going to happen. I, 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 I actually am speechless. Yeah, it's a crazy, crazy story. That coroner, actually, Charles Willey, who predicted that, he actually just died uh, oh. a few weeks ago. Yeah, just died in New York at the age of 76. Oh, young. Mm -hmm. I he, mean, by he, modern times. Yeah, he went on to become kind of a famous coroner involved with like a, a flight crash and some other things. Uh, yeah. Uh, this first, this, I had, I found uh, interesting about this story. This first picture is Golden Gate Park. We have been to San Francisco so many times. Have we never been there? Never been to this park. It is huge. It's a gigantic park in San Francisco, 20% bigger than Manhattan Central Park, three miles long, half a mile wide, over a thousand acres, third most visited park in the U.S. after Central Park and D.C.'s Lincoln Memorial. And I never even thought about it. And I've been to San Francisco probably 25 times. Okay. This is going to be what's going to sound like an ignorant question. Yeah. Is it by the Golden Gate? Well, par uh, no, I don't think it is necessarily. Uh, I don't think it. I, I, I mean, don't see it. No, I think uh, it, it is not. I don't believe it is. I was thinking about, but, it, but it's by a lot of the city. Parts of it are. Are I mean, you sure huge. we've never been in any part of it? If, if we, it maybe, but accidentally walked through a portion of it. Because but definitely the, never intentionally toured any part of this park. What's the park down by uh, the uh, pier? Well, there's the ferry build. That's a tiny little bit. That's not connected to this. Okay. And then what about the park? We've Remember, been to a few tiny little parks over there. Yeah. What about the park? Like when we rode bikes and went over the bridge mm -hmm. and then we were 
No, that was a different part of the uh, bay. Huh. I can't remember the name of that, but no. Like this is like, Dang, uh, okay, yeah, Alfred Lake. Uh, this next picture, this is Alfred Lake uh, by where Leroy's uh, remains were found. Uh, one of just many lakes in the park. One of the smallest, more of a pond, drained in early 2020 uh, okay. for some kind of rehab. Oh. And then the 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 next picture here is a man in the midst of a Santeria ritual huh. in the throes of something, like possession or something. Mm -hmm. So he Whew. has or thinks he has some Orisha inside his body. And then this uh, next one is a Santeria sacrifice ritual. Uh, oh, it was, it was what is that? Blood and animal parts. In like a bowl? What are they making? Stew? No, it's um, and sadly I I cannot think of there's there's a different term for it in Santeria than there is in Palomayambe, but it's uh ah, it, it it's part of the ritual. It, it, there's a term for that bowl that you put the tributes inside of, Ugh. but it can be like there looks like there's fruit in there. It what can be they? food. It can be you know chicken parts. It can be any type, just blood from any type of animal. What do they do with that? After they I, collect I, all I, the I bits? I can't off the top of my head, okay. like, relay it me. Yes. It's, I mean, there's a variety of rituals. That'd be a whole other thing. Sure, sure, but sure. It's, but it's just... Uh... It's gross. <laughs> and then this last one is Leroy's tombstone. So, yeah, and they never did, never did find his... Yep, his killer. Dang. But, yeah, just a very, very strange, you know, just... Uh... On the fringe of what we would cover here. Paranormal-ish, I think, just because of that ritual. A absolutely. Uh... So I, I made some notes. Yeah. I, I do have a question, and I don't know if you have the answer, but in these possessions that they do, mm -hmm. do you volunteer to be the one to be possessed? I don't know any of the real hard details about, like, I've read this stuff, but as far yeah. I, I just don't want to speak without notes. Sure, sure. Because um, I'd be pulling stuff out of my ass. Oh, yeah. But sometimes you know, because sometimes you find yourself going sure, in a little rabbit sure. hole. So yeah. I just didn't know. Oh, yeah, yeah. I just can't re remember uh, right now. Yeah. But I, I believe, I, I want to say yes. So mm -hmm. I'm going to say to our listeners, I am not speaking affirmatively. I think, I think you volunteer. Uh, I strongly think that you volunteer to have, you want one of these things to take possession of you so you can connect uh -uh. with your God. No, thank you. No, thank I, I never want to be possessed it, by anything. <laughs> and I do know this uh, because I encountered this on Time Suck. When it comes to Santeria, Palomayambi, these syncretic religions, these kind of diaspora, it's a tough word. <laughs> I never, never want to pronounce it right. These like these religions that came from Africa and then melded with Catholicism because they couldn't be openly worshipped. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They never had a central text. There's no like Bible. Right. And so they couldn't have one. A lot of people will say like, well, this is how you do it. And then the next person you talk to be like, nope, that's entirely wrong. It's practiced in a wide variety of ways. Sure. You know, be, be, because for, you know, many, many years, it, it passed along like orally. Exactly. And yeah, so it was like a telephone game and, and there isn't like a, this is how it must be done. Yeah. Yeah. For those of you who are uh, longtime stand-up fans of Dan's, you'll recall that I had a very fun incident in San Francisco. Yes, yes. Falling down an escalator. Right, right, right. So it's called She Led With Her Face, if you're curious <laughs> about my first time to San Francisco. That's right, your very first time falling, to falling down the first escalator. Time. Yeah. So special, Dan. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, boy. Yeah, that, that story's crazy. Mm -hmm. And and also, I mean, so sad, you know, this veteran mm -hmm. and, you know, no mention of his family. So mm -hmm. to me, like an element of this story is so upsetting because it's like, oh, this poor man mm -hmm. serves his country, mm -hmm. comes back, has all this like clearly PTSD, all this messed up stuff in his life. Yeah. And then is murdered in some horrific manner and no family to like continue to seek out justice in his yeah. name. I mean, there, I mean, if, if there was, that wasn't written in the articles at the time. I mean, I so doubt probably it. not. So probably there's it. a chance they wouldn't have even known that he had died, you know, if they'd lost contact. <sighs> That's a rough story on yeah. a lot of levels. Uh, do you, do you feel ready to move on from a creepy murder and into a creepy poltergeist and possession tale? Yeah. It sounds like a lot of fun. The second story is a big one. Okay. Uh, and zero setup. So get ready. I'm just going to uh, hop right in, long and crazy, possibly super demonic tale. Sweet. Time now for the tale of the House of 200 Demons. The flies wouldn't go away. In November of 2011, Latoya Ammons, her mother Rosa, and her three children, two boys ages 7 and 9, and her 12-year-old daughter, had all just moved into a house located at 3860 Carolina Street in Gary, Indiana. Though just 25 miles from downtown Chicago, Gary couldn't have been more different from that big city at the time. Back in 1995, Gary was the per capita murder capital of the U.S. 
But by 2011, the crime rate had lowered substantially, and Carolina Street had become a quiet row of primarily single-story family homes. Hmm. The Ammons house was white with a screened-in porch built in 1926. It was first occupied by a newlywed couple who would remain there for the rest of their long lives. After that couple's deaths, the house was sold and then used as a rental property. In 2004, Charles Reed purchased the property and continued to rent it out. With two bedrooms and one bathroom, it wasn't anything huge, but Latoya and her family were happy to be there. At least until the flies showed up roughly a month after they unpacked. It was December when they first spotted them. Latoya and her mother Rosa were out on the porch when the flies first arrived. They were huge, slow, and black, and seemed out of place for Illinois in the middle of winter. The two women killed all the flies they could, but no matter how many they killed, there were always more. Within a few days, it was impossible to go onto the porch without being swarmed by these flies. Flies that seemed like they just wouldn't stay dead. This is not normal, Latoya would later recall her mother telling her, We killed them and killed them and killed them, but they kept coming back. Then... The sound started. As Latoya and Rosa lay awake at night, they each heard the sound of the doors to the basement, with the door to the basement slamming over and over and over again. No way. At first, Latoya thought it was the children, and one night she got up to tell them to go back to bed. But on her way to the basement stairs, she realized that she'd passed the kids' bedrooms, and they were all fast asleep. Uh. This understandably sent a chill down her spine. As she stood at the top of the basement stairs, she heard soft steps on the bottom, a bottom completely hidden by shadow. The steps creaked on the last few stairs. It sounded like something was walking down into the basement. And then she heard the sound of someone walking deeper into the basement and did not even consider going down herself to investigate. Instead, she convinced herself, like so many do, that she was just hearing things. She was just confused by the sounds of a new house. It was old after all. And her mom had told her that sometimes fluctuations in temperature could create strange sounds. So she went back to bed. One night, a few weeks later, her mother, Rosa, woke up in the middle of the night. Not unusual for an older woman. She'd been waking up in the middle of the night for years. But it was strange how immediately she had woken up this night. Her eyes flew open. Suddenly, she was wide awake. No drowsiness. Zero disorientation. And then her eyes adjusted to the dark. And she realized she was not alone. There was something or someone standing at the foot of her bed. This was not just something she or anyone else could write off as being part of a creaky old house. She could see someone. Holding her breath, afraid to scream out, she watched as the shadowy figure slipped away from her bed and moved across her room. And then it slipped quietly, eerily quietly, out her open bedroom door, a door she was sure she'd close before going to sleep. Making this encounter even more disturbing, when she got out of bed, she discovered large, wet boot prints on the floor. She checked the front and back doors. They were both shut and locked. Also, the prints did not lead outside. They just suddenly stopped inside the house. She couldn't make any sense of what she was seeing, and she wouldn't understand it any better when it happened again and again and again. Oh my god. This was far from an isolated incident. Time and time again, she would wake up, feel as though she was being watched, see a moving, shadowy figure inside her room, something that had been watching her sleep, and then, after watching this thing exit her room, she'd be unable to write it off as sleep paralysis or as a recurring nightmare because she would find the wet boot prints on the floor. Absolutely not. Get the fuck out. Most disturbing, the prints were always the thickest on the floor, just past the foot of her bed, as if whatever this was had been pacing there back and forth for quite some time. And Rosa wasn't the only one encountering something disturbing in the house. Four months after moving in, at around two in the morning on March 10th, 2012, Rosa heard her daughter scream. Come here! Latoya shouted from the kid's room, and when Rosa got there, she was shocked to see her 12-year-old granddaughter levitating above her bed. (sighs) Her seven and nine-year-old grandsons were watching. The girl was unconscious. And then her stunned family surrounding her, she slowly lowered back down onto her bed. A couple minutes later, her eyes opened and she was confused as to why her entire family was in the lit bedroom in the middle of the night. She had no memory of anything. Latoya would later say it attacked and raised her up off the bed, snatched her up off the bed. Latoya and Rosa contacted multiple churches in the area, but most offered no help, at least not anything useful. They'd be told to just keep praying, but they were already doing that and it wasn't working. Finally, one unnamed church official recommended cleaning the home with bleach and ammonia, then use oil to draw crosses on every door and window. 
and the pouring of olive oil on her three children's hands and feet, then smeared oil in the shape of crosses on their foreheads. Huh. Before doing that, worrying it might anger whatever was already in their home and make things worse, Rosa and Latoya sought out a second opinion. They wanted someone to actually come inside the house and see for themselves what was going on. So they contacted two psychics, who both visited the house. And the Ammons later claimed that these two psychics both told them that their house was infested with demons, that there were in fact roughly 200 of them inhabiting the home. What? They also both suggested that Latoya and her family move out immediately. It was dangerous for them to continue to stay there, but the Ammons could not afford to move. Oh, dang it. Three generations of the same family were not living in a small rental together because it was ideal. They were doing it because it was all they could afford. They were barely getting by. If they couldn't move, the psychics recommended that they at least sage and sulfur the entire house. Interestingly, one of the psychics also suggested they create an altar of sorts in the basement. Say what? Following this advice, Latoya covered a small table with a white sheet and placed upon it a white candle and a statue of Mary, Joseph, and Jesus next to an open Bible displaying Psalm 91. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness nor the plague that destroys at midday. For three days following the sage ritual on the altar, the house was quiet. <sighs> and then something began to twist and warp the Ammon children. Latoya noticed that her children's eyes would bulge uncontrollably, and they now often spoke in much deeper tones than normal. Watching them play from another room, when they didn't know she was watching them, she'd see foreign diabolical smiles stretch across their faces. A few days after the beginning of the sinister smiles, Latoya walked in on her seven-year-old son having a strange conversation with no one, no one she could see at least. She was used to her kids playing pretend, even having imaginary friends, but this was different. Later, when her two older children were out of the house with Rosa, she walked into the kid's bedroom to find her seven-year-old crouched in the closet again talking to himself. Who are you talking to? She asked. The invisible boy, her son replied, grinning the new odd wicked smile. She followed her son's eyes to where this invisible boy supposedly was, and while she didn't see anything, she did feel something terrible. Things continued to get stranger. Her middle child, her nine-year-old son, suddenly described her very calmly, being held down and choked as though he'd just recently experienced it. Excuse me? And maybe he had been choked. Maybe something in the home was choking not only him, but also his sister. Counselors at Latoya's daughter's school noticed that the 12-year-old girl had become uncharacteristically moody and withdrawn. The girl told counselors that she sometimes felt as if she were being choked and held down so she couldn't speak or move. She claimed that voices told her that she'd never see her family again and wouldn't live another 20 minutes. Oh my god! What's that? The counselor once asked, pointing to a cut on the girl's forehead that required stitches. The girl replied that a headboard had slammed into her, cutting her forehead. Had anyone pushed her into it, the counselors wanted to know? No, she said. No one you could see. She'd been alone in the room. Something was now afflicting Latoya as well. She would later say that she began to feel weak, lightheaded, and warm, that her body shook, and she felt out of control. She worried that something demonic had taken up residence within her. On April 19, 2012, due to numerous family members beginning to feel ill, to feel ill, the Ammons consulted a family physician. During her examination, according to an Indiana Department of Child Services report, Latoya, scre Latoya screamed obscenities at the doctor in demonic voices. Oh my God. During his examination, her seven-year-old boy was lifted and thrown into the wall with nobody touching him. <gasps> Both boys lost consciousness during the examination. 911 was called. Seven or eight police officers and an ambulance arrived. The boys were taken to Methodist Hospital in Gary, Indiana. While the doctor wrote in his medical notes that the family had delusions of ghosts in their home and hallucinations, he also told the Indianapolis Star that 20 years and I've never heard anything like that in my life. I was scared when I walked into the room. Later at the hospital, the nine-year-old boy awoke seemingly normal, but the seven-year-old awoke in a screaming rage and had nurses, uh, nurses had to restrain him and tie him to the bed. Oh my God. The hospital reported the family to DCS with allegations of possible child abuse or neglect. In the complaint, the hospital theorized that the family may have been suffering from mental illness and that the children were performing for their mother. DCS family case manager Valerie Washington was the initial investigator assigned. Washington's report stated that hospital personnel examined Ammons along with her children. Washington found them to be healthy and free of marks or bruises. And a hospital psychiatrist evaluated Ammons and determined she was of sound mind. And then the case manager wrote that she witnessed some highly unusual events. During her interview in the hospital, Washington wrote that the seven-year-old began to growl and then his eyes rolled back in his head 
Then she witnessed him grab his older brother's throat and choke him until medical staff had to separate the two. During a subsequent interview with the children and Latoya's mother, Rosa, an interview where hospital nurse Willie Lee Walker was also present, the seven-year-old again began to growl. He threatened his older brother, stating in a deep, unnatural voice, It's time to die. I will kill you. <sighs> During another visit, this caseworker witnessed something far stranger, something a lot harder to fake than a change in one's voice. Before leaving the hospital, Rosa was talking to her grandsons when she saw the same menacing, strange grin erupt across her nine-year-old's face. Then she claimed to witness the boy walk backwards up the wall all the way to the ceiling. Oh, my God. Before flipping over and casually landing on his feet. Oh, my God. The whole time, he never let go of her hand, and she was not the only witness. The caseworker was also present and claimed to have witnessed the same thing. Oh, I feel sick. Under police questioning, Valerie Washington was asked if it were possible that the boy had run up the wall as though performing some type of acrobatic trick. Washington replied that it was no trick. She said she saw the boy glide backward on the floor, wall, and ceiling. And she wasn't the only additional witness. Nurse Walker also claimed to have watched this impossible occurrence. Both Washington and Walker ran out of the room when it happened. A doctor was summoned to the room, didn't believe the events as they were being described. He asked the boy to walk up the wall again, but the boy claimed to have no memory of what he was talking about, even though it had just taken place less than a minute earlier. Valerie Washington was quoted in a police report as saying she believed that there was an evil influence at work on the Ammon family. Following the wall walking, the seven-year-old remained at the hospital with Latoya while Rosa took the other children to a relative's home. The following day, on April 20th, 2012, Reverend Michael Magano, a priest at St. Stephen Martyr Parish in Maryville, Indiana, received a call from the hospital chaplain, David Neville, explaining, asking him to hurry over and perform an exorcism on the nine-year-old boy who'd left the hospital. He was convinced that demonic forces were at play. That night at 6.30 p.m., Magano interviewed the Ammon family at the Carolina Street House for several hours. During the course of the interview, Rosa pointed to a flickering light bulb. Each time Magano approached it, the flickering would stop. He attributed this flickering to a demonic presence he stated he could feel around him. Valerie Campbell, present for all of this, then pointed out some Venetia blinds moving in the uh, kitchen even though there was no airflow that in that room. Sorry, and she is the uh, a new caseworker. Magano also saw, and this is really chilling, wet boot prints no. throughout the home. The same kind Rosa had been finding at the foot of her bed, the kind left by the shadow figure that watched her sleep. Suddenly, LaToya complained of a bad headache. Magano didn't think the root of her pain was due to anything physically wrong, and he touched her head with the crucifix, and she immediately began to convulse. Magano told the family he was convinced that they were being tormented by demons and that all of them, other than Rosa, were possessed. Magano believed that the house had become cursed as a result of a hex placed on LaToya. Magano would later say, I think there was a curse placed on the mother, that she was the focus, possibly by an ex-boyfriend or his wife, and that combined with some tragedy and perhaps occult practices that had taken place in the house before, it had all opened up some sort of portal. Magano blessed the house with prayers and holy water and advised the family to leave. Whatever was in the house, he said, was simply too powerful and had already established too much control over them for them to risk fighting it. Following the meeting with Magano, Rosa, LaToya, and LaToya's children moved in with relatives. Oh, good. Several days later, DCS family case manager, Washington, accompanied by two police officers, uh, so the original case manager, Captain Charles Austin from the Gary, Indiana Police Department, and an officer from the Hammond, Indiana Police Department, met with LaToya and Rosa at the home. As they walked through the house, one of the officer's digital recorders suddenly went from being nearly fully charged to being completely drained of power. The officers played a second recorder later and heard the distinct sounds of someone saying, Hey, out of here. Hey, you, out of here. They also felt something in the basement stairs. One photo of the basement stairs had a cloudy white image in the upper right-hand corner that seemed to resemble a face. Additional photos taken by Captain Austin's iPhone showed strange, shadowy silhouettes passing in between the rooms. Following the walkthrough, Austin reported that the radio in his police vehicle malfunctioned like it never had before. Also, once he got home, his garage door would not open. His car seat and his infinity began moving on its own. Ooh. He took it to the dealership the next day. They said there were no electrical problems. Despite numerous people not related to the Ammon family all claiming strange encounters with something paranormal, in April of 2012, 
the Department of Child Services petitioned the Lake Juvenile Court for temporary wardship of the three children. No! And the request was granted. No! DCS temporarily placed the daughter and older son at St. Joseph's Carmelite <sighs> Home in East Chicago. Latoya's youngest son was sent to Christian Haven in Wheatfield, Indiana for psychiatric evaluation. <laughs> At St. Joseph's, clinical psychologist Joel Schwartz examined the daughter and older son, and according to Schwartz, the daughter claimed to see shadowy figures in the home and had twice gone into a trance. The older son claimed that the doors would slam and stuff would start to move around on its own. At Christian Haven, clinical psychologist Stacy Wright reached the same conclusions. She noted that the boy was clear and logical, except when talking about demons. Psychologists examining LaToya said that while she was guarded, she did not seem to be experiencing symptoms of psychosis or thought disorder. They noted that she was very religious and superstitious, superstitious, but not hallucinating. As part of the DCS action plan, in addition to therapy, one of the requirements was that the children not discuss demons and being possessed and take responsibility for their actions. Can you imagine anything more exciting to a demon, if real, uh, that was possessing your body than a court order to not talk about them? My God. The court also required that LaToya use alternate forms of discipline not directly related to religion and demonic possession. Recommended discipline included encouragement, rules, and withholding privileges. But despite all these orders and examinations, the courts also seemed to acknowledge that something strange was going on at the house. They required LaToya to find a job and alternate housing due to, quote, the paranormal activity at the house on Carolina Street. On May 10, 2012, another group gathered to investigate the Carolina Street House. In addition to Rosa, LaToya, Captain Austin, and Father Magano, uh, four other police officers, as well as a new DCS family case manager, Samantha Illick, all were present. Why did they have a new case manager now? Was it because the state wanted a new objective caseworker to assess what was really going on? No, it was because Valerie Washington was terrified and refused to go back into the Ammons house. I mean, can you blame her? That's how real all this was to her. And soon the new caseworker would also come to fear the Ammons home. According to Samantha Illick's report, while standing in the living room, her left pinky finger began to tingle, whiten, and feel broken. Less than 10 minutes later, Illick had a panic attack, could not breathe, and ran outside the house. Worried about the area under the basement stairs, Father Magano blessed some salt and spread it under the stairs and throughout the rest of the basement. Then when Magano began to question LaToya in the house, she complained of a headache again, and she became angry with him and left. Magano compiled a report, sent a letter to Bishop Dale Melzick requesting permission to perform an exorcism on LaToya. When his request was denied, he decided to perform a minor ritual that would not require church approval. He described it as a form of intense blessing. The ritual consisted of prayers, statements, and appeals to cast out demons. Two of the police officers from the second investigation and Illick witnessed this ritual. Illick claimed that she got chills during the nearly two-hour ritual and said that it felt like someone was in the room with you, someone breathing on your neck. And how creepy is this? Following the ritual, Illick suffered a very odd string of medical problems, including a third-degree burn from a motorcycle crash, three broken ribs from jet skiing, a broken bone in her hand, and a broken ankle, all separate incidents, all happening in a period of less than two weeks. What? Illick later stated, I had friends who wouldn't talk to me because they believed that something had attached itself to me. Good Lord. After the cleansing ritual, Magano claimed that he'd learned the names of the demons plaguing Latoya. Among the named demons was Beelzebub, the Lord of the Flies, one of the seven princes of the underworld. Magano prepared another exorcism request, submitted it on May 21st, 2012. A few days later, it was granted. In June of 2012, Magano and an assistant performed three exorcisms on Latoya in a Maryville church. The first occurred on June 1st, followed by a second on June 8th, and the third and final took place on June 29th. Two police officers from earlier investigations attended the first two exorcisms. Before the third exorcism, Rosa and Latoya had moved into a new home in Indianapolis, which Magano had blessed. During all of the exorcisms which took place in Latin, LaToya convulsed. Her eyes rolled back into her head. She growled like an animal. Then, during the third exorcism, LaToya stopped reacting to prayers, which had caused her to curse and scream before, and Magano took this as proof that the demons had left her body. And then, life immediately got much better for the Ammons. What? In November of 2012, a year after the intense paranormal experiences had begun, DCS allowed LaToya to regain full custody of her children. The Ammons case was formally closed in February 2013. Another new family case manager, Christina Olgenik, 
wrote in her notes, no demonic presences or spirits in the home. The Ammons family seemed to no longer be plagued by demons, but were they ever plagued in the first place? Captain Austin, a 36-year a 36-year veteran of the Gary Police Department, said he initially thought this whole thing was a hoax. But after several visits to the Ammon home and several interviews, Austin now has no doubt that demonic forces were indeed attacking Latoya and her family. He now believes strongly in the existence of a type of evil the world of science doesn't yet acknowledge or understand. <sighs> That's some intense stuff, right? Yeah, and so recently. I don't know mm-hmm. why it like it really freaks me out when it's kind of current. Mm-hmm. Seems maybe more relatable or something. Yeah, and also my blanket kept falling down and my little shawl kept falling down. <laughs> and then I was like, my shoulder, I'm gonna feel breath on my shoulder. Like I could not. <laughs> and it, sometimes I bump the microphone and so it becomes this like loud thing and I was trying to move it, but then there was too much <laughs> action. I was having a whole situation over here. A whole situation. Uh this, this first picture is, Ugh. this is the house. This is the house that the Ammons rented uh, on Carolina Street in okay. Gary, Indiana. Just like a whatever normal mm-hmm. Midwest house. Yep. Uh, this next picture is Father Michael Magano. Okay. So that's the guy who came and did the exorcisms. He looks a little bit like Harrison Ford. He does look a little bit like Harrison Ford. Uh, mm-hmm. And then this next one is Latoya Ammons. Still, I'm getting the chills. Mm-hmm. And then this final picture is a photo of the Ammons' children. Ha, they do. ha, ha. <laughs> Dan is such an idiot with his, like, <laughs> joke photos. I will say, at least you didn't give it away before the photo went up. Right. Uh, for those of you listening uh-huh. and not watching, uh-huh. uh, Dan put up a photo of four baby dolls with, like, weird bulging eyeballs, like black fangs. lipstick. Like, like vampire fangs. I don't even see the fangs. Who has fangs? The little baby up on the top left. Oh, they all do. Oh, Look at the baby up front. He's got a little fang sticking out. I can't really see him. I just figured those are babies. baby teeth. <laughs> well, thank you for the zoom in, Joe Paisley. And yes, I can now. Oh, and even. Little evil babies. Um, Black painted toenails. Mm-hmm. That baby doll on the left has a very realistic looking foot. Mm-hmm. Because that's that that because they're real. That's the kids. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. <laughs> okay, so this this story is this really the kids. Are you going to show me a photo? No, there was no photo. I mean, and their names were mentioned, so I think she protected them. I I like that. Uh-huh, Good for me her. Too, yeah. Um. And j- little side note on this story: in January of 2014, the Carolina Street home, check this out, was purchased by noted paranormal investigator <gasps> uh, Zach Bagans. Oh. Host of the channel tra- Travel Channel series Ghost Adventures for thirty five thousand dollars, and then he destroyed it. He bought the house to to just uh, erase it. To have he, it demolished and tore, torn apart. So he never like went in. He didn't. He did. He, he did. did. But, but then he got rid of it. And then he produced a documentary horror film about uh, all of this called Demon House that was released uh, in 2018. Wow. Mm-hmm. Put it on so, the list. So he really uh, got sucked into this story. Did you uh, watch any of it? I did not. I did not watch it. I, I watched the trailer. Yeah, mm-hmm. it, looked, it looked very interesting. Okay. But I, but I did not watch the the film. Okay. That. Uh... Or do- quasi documentary. Do- yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to think, like, when it's not a documentary and you're making fun of something, it's called a mockumentary. Mm-hmm. I wonder what it's called when it's, like, a demon possession. Yeah, this was, like... Uh, it was marketed as a documentary, but I, I did, like, l- read some of the reviews. Yeah. And the reviews, I can't remember the term now they called it, but um, almost like a found footage, show, like, mixed with a documentary. Uh, I mean, okay. it, 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 you know, it's technically a documentary, but they did, like, uh, enough, I guess, dramatic reenactments. It uh-huh. was more of, like, a horror film. Got it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, uh, oh, the, as soon as you said that they went to the physician, yeah, my heart sank. I was like, dang it, they're going to take her kids. Mm-hmm. I'm so happy that she was open to being uh, exercised and that she got her kids back. Like, I love that it actually has a really happy ending. Yeah, it does you end know well. I mean? it the does family end ends up well. together. They're all okay. I mean, they're probably mentally super scarred. By what happened, how could you not be? Uh, yeah, how could you not be? Although it sounds like they kind of kept forgetting things that would happen. So my hope is that yeah. maybe the kids, I mean, they were young, but not super young. Maybe they mm-hmm. can just in time, you know, your memories kind of fade. Yeah. Hopefully in time, they can really forget what happened and they just mm-hmm. don't talk about it too much and the house is destroyed. Like, yeah, all the things. And, and of course, like with all these stories for the skeptical peepers out there, it's, it's like, yes, there's been critics of this. What, what, I, what I found, you know, of their claims, of course, there always is. Yeah. What, what I find really interesting about this story, though, is the... You know, a variety of police officers and case walkers who also got pulled into this. Right. Who it would I not. Think you it would case not. Caseworkers. I, I thought I said caseworkers. What did I say? Case walkers. Case walkers. 
Like Skinwalker? Skinwalkers. I think one oh of the God. one of the people, their last name I think was Walker, wasn't it? Uh, I don't even think so. Maybe. Oh, maybe maybe Valerie's, I don't know. Anyways. But, but they got pulled into it and, you know, not, nothing I found said that they knew these people before all of this. So they would have so no, no incentive. So no reason to corroborate? Yeah, exactly. And there's no reason. If anything, that would be detrimental, I would think, to their career where you're mm-hmm. supposed to be an objective observer of family conditions. Mm-hmm. And you're coming back to your boss at the uh, this government job saying like, oh, I think demons are to blame. That's never going to go well. <laughs> no. And so many <clears throat> people in mm-hmm. reputable positions, doctors, yeah. police yeah, officers, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, case workers, yeah, social workers. Yeah. That, a lot that, of people. That thing at the hospital where, you know, three different yeah. adults claim to have seen this kid go up the wall in that, a way that you can't oh, that just detail. recreate. I, I just kept <laughs> That's envisioning that. That's a really disturbing that. one. Yeah, I kept envisioning that over and over, and it was giving me chills. Mm-hmm. That is really spoopy. <laughs> yes. If I, if I walked into the house and, like, Kyler or Monroe... We're up on the ceiling. Stop. I think I, just, I can't. I, I would just shut the door and just leave. And, and never would, come back? I would come back in a couple hours and okay. I, I would go somewhere and convince myself that what I just saw, I didn't see. Right. You were on shrooms. I probably, weed, I probably, you know, acid, I, something. I, I probably walked down to a bar and I'd have several drinks and just be like, no, 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 no. And then I would go back and be like, okay, restart. I just pushed a reset button. I'm going to walk back in, and, and if they're cool now, God, then it never happened. If I could find, like, the world's strongest magnets, and I could put them in oh, the attic area, and then on the bottom of Kyler's shoes, probably Monroe's shoes, because she oh can kind of make those faces at you that you're like, you little stinker. For like, for like a dedic- oh, oh, that would be so great to do That would be the you. best prank ever. If you had the- I don't even know what kind of technical capabilities you would need to pull this off. You but- just need magnets, Dan. I got it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's just, easy. just super powerful magnet. Yeah. But but if you could do something like that, yeah, and, and you could get like uh, like the special effects makeup. Oh my god! Can you imagine if like okay, a family, let's say, let's just say whatever, family of four, and then three of them, one parent, and, and then the two kids get crazy demonic looking makeup, get f- full on dressed up like that, get some weird flickering lights in the house, and. <laughs> And they're walking around on the ceiling. If you walk, you would lose your mind. What's that song, Dancing on the Ceiling? Ah. It would be so great to just have that playing, though. Like a super spooky scene. Yeah. And then just like a really happy song, Dancing oh, on the man. Ceiling. That, man. That like contra- that juxtaposition, mm. <laughs> that would really mess you up. <laughs> like, what, Dad? No big deal. Uh, yeah, I don't know what would be scarier. Like just a normal song like that. Or if it was just like, Bleh! like some crazy noises coming out of there. Uh, no, that just feels too, too much. staged to me. Ah. You see where I'm going? Okay. All right. Yeah. A, a little bit of normalcy, I think, adds. To me, that's why it was so creepy that that kid walked up the wall like that. Because he's just standing there holding his mom or his grandma's hand when he did it. There's a nurse there. They're in this very, like, normal setting that we've all been in. We've right. all been in a doctor's office or sure. a hospital room. So for it to just happen in this completely regular place. Yeah makes it so much more creepier yeah. to me than if you would have said like and he was in a haunted basement and then blah 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 it's like okay yeah it can then be it's too like much. yeah of course of course that would happen there why is it happening in the middle of the day ah, in a completely regular setting yeah that makes sense yeah that makes sense it's too much when you said when you said the um dance on the ceiling lionel richie oh, and love the, lionel richie mm-hmm. oh my god i love him and then i thought that was like ah, th- but that would be too much the other way that'd be too like you know convenient and then so my i was like what other song would work it's just like a regular song and it just i'm cracking myself up immediately kenny rogers the gambler popped into my head <laughs> but i don't know like like full-on horror such flickering light demonic and then no you wind walk to hold you gotta know when to hold them <laughs> know when to fold them no when to walk away. <laughs> no when to walk away as you just exit yep. that. I'm leaving. Um, Dan, before I dive into my story, do you want to mm-hmm. talk about those white things? Oh, yes. Thank you. I, I had a this mental note. Is, we got so many good presents yeah, and so gifts in the mail. Other and just, stuff to show in the future. Yeah. And just yeah. so you guys know, like, we're so grateful. We yeah. love all of it. It all gets, like, put around the studio. Uh, sometimes you see it here on the set. Yeah. It's always posted on our social media with uh-huh. shout outs. We try to tag you if we can find you on yeah. socials. Uh we would have to spend an entire show just thanking people. So, so yeah, it, we're, we're lucky. so grateful. And just please know that it's never just like, pff, who cares? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But it's just so hard to um, find a way to thank each person every time. And these will be – so th- thanks to uh, Joseph uh, Lichtigue for these four creepy little squishy ghost heads. So there, there's four different ones. Are they ghost heads ones. or are they little baby heads? They're little like – we'll have them on socials to get a better look. But they're four like little – no, they're not – maybe they're – 
No, I think they're like creepy. I don't know what they are, I, but they're creepy. I want to put one like right in the camera. They're so uh, bizarre. They remind I mean, me of... I got Layla and her fellow little squishy army. I, I love the texture of the, the white guys. Mm-hmm. They're really like, I don't know. Uh, they remind me of Game of Thrones. The, the, the White Walkers? No, the man with no face. Oh, yes. That whole... Uh, I think it was a whole season, right? Yep. With what's her face in there? Arya. Arya, thank mm-hmm. you. It's been a while. <laughs> you building okay. a fortress? I got a little fortress. Nice. Are you ready for a really long, totally different, yep. interesting yep. dive? I am. Okay. Um, so this this story, like I said, is significantly longer than actually than any story that's ever been sent in, and I hesitate to even call it a story. It's really this woman's life, okay. and like how. Um, yeah, it, it's just complicated okay, to even okay. explain. So we'll be hearing from someone who is a empath, you know, so someone who like really feels things strongly, mm-hmm. um, and possibly sees beyond the veil. Uh, okay. I, I just, let's, let's hear it. Yeah. It really freaked me out. And also, um, the teller of the story sent me like such a lovely note. Cause this, this story has been included in the book mm-hmm. and, um, she just sent me like a really lovely set of crystals and yeah, I just, I think she's pretty special. Cool. Okay. Dear Dan and Lindsay, greetings from a creepy creeper peeper pal. I've started recently listening to Scared to Death with the intention of listening to Time Suck, but I love the way you two work together. So there you go. Awesome. I heard on one of your podcasts that you're looking to produce a book of stories that, and that did pique my interest. I don't want to share with many people what my life is like because I get sick of the judgment and the anger that come along with it. If you keep reading, you'll understand where I'm coming from. I do apologize for the length of this letter. I have so much I want to share with you, but I don't even know where or how to start. If this doesn't make sense, at least you will have a ridiculously long ass letter from a listener and maybe some possible stories. My name is Sky. I was adopted at birth in Salt Lake City, Utah, birthed by a woman who is half Apache Indian and who knows what else, with a man who is one quarter Cherokee and the rest Irish and possibly lots of German. Possibly irrelevant details, but details nonetheless that bring the Native American and other aspects into the story. I don't want to open up the door to people coming to me for help, like a mob of energetic people sucking my soul away. I went through a time where I gave all of my energy into everyone else and I had a complete mental breakdown when I found myself empty of light and no one around me to help lift me up. I will never allow that to happen again. Lindsay, you know as well as anyone that you cannot let people drain you of your light. It must be a give and take in order for us humans to coexist in a truly peaceful and possible way. Rambling, rambling, rambling. Sorry for all the random details. I'm an obsessive compulsive Scorpio. Me too. At a very young age, I knew things were different for me, within me and the world around me. I can't explain it, but I have memories of my early infancy. I remember what my mother said to me when she held me for the last time. I was adopted, remember, so the words came from my birth mother. And when I met her some 30 years later, the first words I said to her were the exact words she had said to me before she gave me away. She could not believe that I had remembered that. Another memory I have is the first time I saw my uncle, aunt, and maternal grandparents. I was days old. I remember the smell of the baby carrier, and I remember what those four people wore and where they stood in the doorway as they peered down on me. I know that memory has merit because my adopted grandmother looked into my eyes. She smiled and told me I would always be her favorite. And I was. I live every day of my life in honor of her, trying to be the embodiment of all her grace and beauty. I have many memories along those lines, but I won't bore you with the details that make up my life. So moving on. I never knew why, but I have always had a strange fear of mirrors. I only used bathrooms in my childhood home where I could open the medicine cabinet and face the mirror away from me. I never told my parents. I just accepted that there was a reason to avoid them. As I got older, I learned that there is a very good reason to fear mirrors, especially for someone like me. When I say someone like me, I don't know what to refer to myself as, but I have more than once been called an empath. I can feel energy like gravity pushing and pulling me in every which direction, and so I avoid a lot of social situations because I don't like the way certain energies feel within me. I don't like to carry it. People are like mirrors. 
When you see them, they see you back. And by that, I mean they can feel that I can feel what they are carrying around with them. As a result, I am very awkward and tend to make people uncomfortable. I wear sunglasses a lot because I don't like the way people stare into my eyes. Once someone is made aware that I'm a supposed empath or whatever you want to call it, that I can feel their pain and to help alleviate it, they look into my mirror, as I call it, and try to understand why being near me makes them feel so much better. These people end up finding a way to be near me and around my circle, and I can't really explain it other than they feed off me and then they disappear and my life sort of kind of goes back to normal. I've had people use me as a type of scurry, by by the on, but the only people I can really read are those closest to me. I keep my circle extremely close to me, and in some way, it's my coven. My husband, he is my protector. My mother, she is my guardian, and I am hers. I can feel when my mother is sad, even if we are at opposite ends of the world. We've shared that tether all my life. My late maternal grandmother was the same way. She knew me. My father, he is my reason, my sounding board, and my birthday twin. We were born in the same hospital on October 30th. I was two weeks early just for him. My adopted brother, he is my polar opposite and helps me maintain my balance through all of this. Before I started moving the mirrors, I had two separate experiences, both between the ages of two and four. My parents woke up to find me screaming for help, crying my eyes out in the kitchen area of our house. They turned on the light and found my little body knelt on the floor, both hands grasping handfuls of my hair and pulling it out as I cried for help. I would smash my own face into the linoleum floor over and over and over again, begging for it all to stop, begging for someone to help me. Completely confused, my parents picked me up off the floor, and as soon as they had me in their arms, the chaos would stop. I lost some hair and I had some bruises on my face, but overall, the ordeal was chalked up to a night terror. Sometime later, my parents woke again to my screams and pleas for help, this time finding me in the bathroom. I was upside down in the toilet, forcing my face into the water, screaming and fighting for air, feet kicking, wilding in the air. There was something else there pushing me into the water, and I saw it in the mirror. But once again, my parents picked me up, and I calmed down as best as I could. Another night terror, they supposed. Nothing you can do about that in the late 80s. So life just went on about its way. After that, I started moving to moving or covering the mirrors if I had to be around them for long periods of time. Things settled down and nothing crazy happened for years after that. Although at that age I knew the mirrors were bad, I still didn't know why there was no way and there was no way I was asking my very LDS parents about this. I knew that the Book of Mormon and the Bible said that people who claimed to be false prophets and seers were trouble. I felt things as a child that I could never understand. Having a hand on my shoulder as a sort of guiding force, telling me don't go that way, go find your brother right now, avoiding danger and protecting me, this feeling was always with me. A friend of mine, uh, an example of this is a friend of mine who I will, will refer to as Sharon and I were about 12 and we went to a Subway restaurant as her mom waited in the car because she was tired from work and didn't want to get out of her car in the heat. As we stood in line to order food, I noticed this man standing at the other end of the line where you pay, just staring at my friend. My friend was focused on what we were going to order, but I could not keep my eyes off this man. Sharon was starting to order up on her tiptoes so that the sandwich maker could hear her. Slowly, just as soon as he heard her voice, this man turned his head and smiled this smile that made my blood run cold. I was frozen in place as I watched him make his way to where we were standing. He stopped right next to my friend, way closer than any other person would be standing to us. I made a sound, but I can't recall, but at that moment, this man first saw me. Great, I thought, now he knows I'm staring at him. And that (laughs) smile of his just got bigger, and his eyes went so dark, it didn't make any sense to me. He had some keys in his hands with a purple rabbit foot on the keychain. He stared intently at Sharon, just twirling his keys around his finger, trying to get her attention. Sharon is now paying attention and watching this man, who she saw as just a nice man with a cool purple rabbit foot on his keychain. I remember his hands, though. He had hands that were worn and dirty, thick and cracked. Also, he had damaged fingernails or had had horrible arthritis. His clothes were like a painter's clothes, I guess, paint on his blue jeans, somewhat dirty and worn with a dingy white t-shirt on. His face is a blur to me, but I remember that smile in those eyes. Sharon had turned to look at him. 
He had her full focus, and he was now down on one knee with his face close enough to hers that his head disappeared behind hers. He took one of those gross hands and ran his fingers through Sharon's hair and across her face as she giggled. I don't know what he said to her, but I was stuck in place and hyper-focused on what he looked like, how I felt, and what he was doing. Studying everything and trying to remember every detail of the encounter for reasons I didn't know yet, only that in my gut I knew I needed to pay attention. He then reached both hands out so as to pick her up in order to help her with her sandwich needs. Just as she leaned in to embrace him, I grabbed her wrist and literally dragged her away from him, shoving her out of the subway as she yelled for me to let go. She was so mad. She said her mom was waiting in the car for food and she was certain that we would get into so much trouble over this. I didn't care, not one bit, as everything in my mind, body, and soul told me to run. I forced her into the car and her mom was very upset that we came back without food. As a child, we knew not to talk back to our elders or to be defiant for no reason. That's just the way it was. I was disciplined by more than just my own family. Whoever the adult was, they were the boss. Terrified, I looked her right in the eye with tears cascading down my face as I told her mother what I saw, what I felt, and what that man did. She sat there quietly for a moment with a blank stare. I thought she was going to blow a gasket. I was so wrong. Sharon's mom took my hands nodded her head slowly, and our eyes and her eyes changed from angry to furious. With that, her mom got out of the car, locked the doors, and went back into Subway. I assumed to order the food that we never got, but she came back empty-handed almost immediately after going inside. Later on that evening, Sharon's mom pulled me aside and asked me more about how I felt and what this man had looked like. I gave her all the details I had retained, asking her why, as I was frozen in fear, and why this man had made me feel the way he did. My friend's mom thanked me for being open enough to feel the negative energy within what she called the ether. Hmm. She asked me how long I had had these types of feelings and if I had ever told anyone. Of course I hadn't. I thought it was a total freak show. She told me that she went in and saw the man and she could also see the darkness in his heart and could see his intentions were far from to be helpful to a child. She told me that I have a gift and I needed to train myself to use this gift, but also to find ways to protect myself. None of this made sense to me at the age of 12, so I just tried to let it go and to forget about it. How would I even protect myself, and what was I protecting myself from? Confusion would stay with me, even to this day, as I don't understand it all, but I am so trying. Now that we have a pseudo-solid base for who I am, let's fast forward to 2007. I had a great group of friends growing up through junior and senior high school, some of which I'm still close with. I even married one of them. We had this friend named Garrett, a warm, caring, lovable soul, as good as they come. I had lost touch with that group of friends. I went on my own way and tried to seek out the reasons I felt the way I did and, and that I was all alone in all of this. Struggling with both internal and external battles, I pretty much ran away from life and didn't want any part of it. I was alone and scared. My family was literally stalking me. My mom had broken into my car once and the list goes on. Needless to say, I have complex, p complex PTSD from the things I have seen in this life, both in the physical realm, from abusers, and all the things in between. Hindsight, everyone who loved me was scared for me. I was off the rails and running from myself. In the moment, though, I had been overcome with this thought that everyone would use me, abuse me, and ultimately destroy me. I had nowhere to turn, and so I gave up, and I gave in, and I attempted suicide. Prior, I took a photo of myself as a reminder that my existence was unnecessary and I was probably a mistake. That photo shows me as a mere phantom, a see-through apparition that seemed to just be in the room, which she did send me this photo, and... To protect her privacy, I won't show it, but it is the weirdest photo. Mm -hmm. She's just transparent. Weird. It is so bizarre. That told me that my decision was correct. The universe had already seen me as ethereal. I sent an email to a friend trying to haphazardly explain why the heaviness was just too much to bear. He, thankfully, called 911 and paramedics showed up and kicked in the door to find my lifeless body on the floor of my parents' living room. I was 24 years old. I watched from the corners... Of, as they worked on my body, separate from my body, I could see them stripping off sections of my clothing so they could place monitors and leads checking for signs of life. They called me a code echo, which means there's no need to rush because I wasn't going anywhere but to the coroner's office. The house phone rang. It was my younger brother who was at junior prom and had a neighbor tell him that cops were at my house and asked if everything was okay. My brother called home and at 17 years old, an officer informed him that I, his only sibling, had passed away and they needed to get in touch with my parents right away. From the corner that I stood watching this happen, I felt the pain and sadness in my brother's voice. I saw what I had done, and that that was not what the universe was trying to tell me, but rather a lesson I must learn. A lesson to take care of myself, and that I had some serious bridges to get over, but that I had to almost die in order to see the larger picture. 
Before I knew it, I was back in my own body, with tubes in every possible orifice there could be. I wasn't awake, but I could hear around me that the nurses and doctors were talking. The words my family would say to me as I came, as they came in one at a time and begging me to be strong. There, were some, there was some liver damage and some minor brain damage from a lack of oxygen. My lungs had suffered immensely because I had overdosed and I would, had been lying in my back. The doctor told my uh, husband, my, my then, not then husband, that I would likely not make it through the night. At that moment, he told me that if I wanted to go, he understood. Not, he didn't say, stay here with me, I need you, I love you, but rather he told me it was okay to move on. I knew then that he was a large part of the lesson that I needed to learn. Five days in a coma, seven in ICU, seven days of recovery in the respite unit, and two weeks shacked up in the wacko basket. This is a poor place to end the details, but I wanted to get back to Garrett. Between 2007 and now, there have been so many things that have happened in my life that have shown me that I was never a mistake or a broken soul, but rather a gifted one. The lesson I learned is that there is reason and purpose to my life. And so I began safely and sparingly using my gift to help. I became a CNA and to help grieving families with the process of death since I had myself been through something like it. One day out of the blue, I got a phone call from Garrett. I hadn't seen or spoken to him in years, but we had always had such chemistry and a connection that neither of us could explain, a truly solid friendship. We went to a diner and shared a plate of french fries, catching up on things the way old friends do. Lots of big smiles and laughs, just the way it always was with him. As we were talking, he brought up his sister and asked me to befriend her as she needed someone to guide her. She was struggling and needed a sister figure to help her realize there's more to life than where she was at. I told him I would start a friendship with her and open a line of communication. When we left the diner, we walked to our cars chatting in the brisk early spring air. Since it was chilly, we didn't stand out there for long, but we did exchange a hug. It wasn't just a hug. In that moment, I knew my life was forever changed that day. I couldn't let him go, and I couldn't explain why either. I finally did get in my car, and we went our separate ways, but that hug stuck with me for a long time. I could not shake it, but I also couldn't read why this moment was so important, or that this would be the very last time I would see Garrett. I just drove away and cried the entire way home. Later that year, on June 6, 2010, on a Sunday night, he jumped on his bullet bike and raced a friend in a Corvette. The details are entirely unnecessary, but he died that night on the side of the road all alone. Honestly, I think he knew that this was going to happen the whole time. I was out of town when it all happened. We didn't have a funeral, but we did have a wake. Months had passed after his death, and I still had neglected to reach out to his sister as I promised I would. One night, I had the most vivid dream. I was working behind the counter at a doctor's office when the door chimed. It was Garrett, walking in like nothing had ever happened. I dropped everything and ran around the counter to hug him as fast as I could. I knew it wasn't real, but I didn't care. I had just missed my friend so much. We sat together on the floor in front of the counter, cross-legged, knees to our chest. I leaned my head onto his shoulder and just cried. Why? Where did you go? He didn't say a word, but hugged me, looked into my eyes, and all I could think of was his sister. He then smiled and walked out the door. He knew his time was coming, and I don't know how, but he knew. His sister needed me as well. She too had dreams of Garrett, but hers were all over the place, and she didn't have a sense of her, and didn't have, I'm sorry, it didn't make sense to her. However, Garrett did once tell her to wait for me in a dream, and she did. And now we'll never be apart again. I have dreams with messages for myself and for those most important to me. They don't happen all the time, but I know certain things are just there in my head, and I can't explain why. Like, for instance, recently we had an earthquake, and that morning before it happened, I woke up sick to my stomach with no explanation why. After the sickness passed, I walked into our living room and just sat down and told my husband something was wrong. The whole house then shook and swayed like we were in the ocean. Each and every earthquake and aftershock since, I get vertigo feelings just before they happen. Like a roller coaster, it's almost how my body feels, but I also get familiar feelings when someone or something is telling me to be aware and open my mind. There are many various times in life when I have known something or someone bad or maybe a change is coming. Most of my life has been a constant question of who I am and what my purpose is. I do take great care in making sure that my mind and soul are kept safe for those that wish to do me harm. There are places I will not go. I can feel energy through the ground and the loudness around places when things get too overwhelming. I always tell my husband and my family that I have tinnitus, but the reality of it is that my life guides me through this that, that whatever guides me through this life is always at my right, whispering in my ear, telling me what to avoid. The thing, uh, things are rarely negative, but those whispers come from something else entirely. My guardian, for a lack of better terms, has always helped me 
in making gut decisions. I have avoided car accidents, possible abductions, and also have been able to protect those closest to me. Who knows what the real answer is? All I know is that mirrors larger than three feet high (laughs) or wide have pagan symbols as protective type spells that I have found in my studies that are written in that are written on them in order to keep those who wish to find an easy way onto our plane on the other side. Mirrors in my life have a way of, uh, mirrors in my life have a way of being doorways or windows to the other side. I see them on the other side and they see me and they hate me. Dark billowy clouds like creatures that are a lot like smoke move quickly and silently across mirrors for me. They come to me more when there is something big happening or about to happen. I've seen them thousands of times. I saw thousands of them the night before the Twin Towers fell. I'm sorry for the length and the chaos of this letter. There were just so many things I wanted to tell you, but I didn't want to bring up sensitive subjects as as religions and September 11th. If you'd like more on that story, I'm happy to share it, but I don't want to be subjected to the possibility for those who don't understand, wanting me to step into the ethereal plane and ask more questions. I made the mistake of sharing with my mom years ago something about the ethereal plane, and I pulled her with me into limbo so she could feel the presence of a friend of hers who had passed away. We were leaning over the dog of this friend of hers who was dying rapidly of something. We had no time to stop or slow down. However, Kathy did come into our home for her sweet dog. And the only way I could help show my mom that I wasn't lying to her all those years, I had told her I had what I thought was a gift. After her friend's dog passed and her home had been returned to a normal pressure, she stared at me for a long time, but we didn't speak of it for nearly a decade. Now my mom fully supports me, even though she is a strong LDS member, which believe that only men can have access to see beyond the veil, the term for this gift that I have, the gift of sight. I have done some research into this, but I stopped when the energy in my home shifted in a negative way. I don't practice my gift much anymore, as far as reaching into the other side. There's just too much evil out there right now, and there's no way to ensure that I won't put my family or myself in danger. Thanks again for reading. I love the podcast and it makes me feel better knowing I'm not the only one out there. Stay creepy, stay weird. As above, so below. A lot. I know. A lot of stuff. It is. And and it is chaotic, but... Yeah. You know, I really felt like it was kind of important to share this, that like it doesn't always make sense and it can be all these weird things. And I think that, you know, like based on messages that I get from people, whether it's in the emails or socials, it's like... So often the message is like, oh my God, that made me feel so much better mm-hmm. because I'm yeah. not alone. So mm-hmm. I, think, I like that message in there. Yeah. And it can be really cathartic to just express it all. Um, I, I just, I know it wasn't necessarily scary. It's just so bizarre. I think all the different things that just happened to her over and over and over, you know, it's just, um, how could you ignore that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. J- those are those uh, type of stories. Yeah. Just interesting to... Um... Anything that I don't know, I, I I'm speechless. I don't know what there's so there were so many things happening there that I just I don't know <laughs> what to say other than I did find it very interesting. Yeah, yeah, sort of yeah. fascinating. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. Yeah. Um. Okay. Well, moving on from that, I have uh, a quick little happy birthday. Uh, happy. <laughs> Thank you, Sky. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Happy birthday to Zach from your girlfriend Alyssa. Uh, happy birthday to Tina from your best friend Kaylee and happy birthday to Cameron from your girlfriend Taylor and a big happy anniversary to Andy from your your wife Ernestina and your future baby uh, and your I'm sorry your future baby she's not pregnant I'm, I totally <laughs> totally messed that up it's a happy anniversary to Andy from your wife Ernestina and your fur baby oh okay. Dusty very different Woo! this read that one could you imagine? <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god, Ernestine, if you're pregnant, I'm really sorry that <laughs> you just <laughs> I just ruined it all. <laughs> uh, well, thanks everyone for the stories. Yeah, thank you, Sky, and everyone else who who sends in stories every week. We greatly appreciate it, and they do all like collectively add to just the body of the the unknown, the weird, the things that science can't explain. Like, why do we have these feelings? Why do we have premonitions? Yeah. Why do people see you know uh, shadows that they think are you know definitely figures, and then they have those you know, sightings corroborated by other people. Just, uh, yeah, it, it all adds up to just like, huh, maybe, mm-hmm. maybe there's a lot more out there than we think sometimes. I agree. Um, thanks for the uh, ratings and reviews lately, Creeps and Peepers. The, yeah, I appreciate that. Appreciate you continuing to rate and review every week. I definitely, uh, definitely notice and, and check it. I can't help myself. I know. It, it is cool. Dan always uh, tells yeah, me. Yeah. And so yeah. It's, it's exciting. It's exciting. Yeah. And, uh, and that's all for today. Uh, thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com or 
or just like, you know, we just shared or like just, you know, any type of encounter with the, how do I explain this? Mm-hmm. Um, everything else you can email to info at scared to death podcast.com. Thanks to Logan and Kate Keith on social media. Thanks to the Keith. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for running badmagicmerch.com and uh, producer Sophie Evans for helping with story curation Joe Paisley Zach Flannery for producing directing custom sound bed creation and Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails please subscribe to Bad Magic Productions if you want to watch on YouTube follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want to see the pictures from the stories and find more content at Scared to Death Podcast and we have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers, which continues to grow. Uh, I haven't checked recently. It's been over 5,000 horror-loving members for a while. Very cool. Thank you to Liz Hernandez for moderating. And enjoy your nightmares, Creeps and Peepers. Hope you are scared to death. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but has no home here within scared to death.